so the title of my talk, which uh, you didn't see, is uh, Bringing Calm to an Otherwise Too Exciting Network World. Um, and how I wanted to start is that networks today are very exciting, right? Um, people who run networks are adrenaline junkies, right? Um, they believe, or at least have enough hubris to believe that they can master any sort of complexity. Um, and so we're left with a world where the networking state of the art roughly looks like this, right? I want to do a lot of things with my network, a lot of important things, but I'm always on the edge of my seat. Right? Anytime I'm trying to do anything, um, or when some network event takes place, I'm worried. When a link fails, are things going to converge? Am I going to have loops? Am I going to black hole things? Um, if I want to try to upgrade software on a switch, what's going to break? What happens if I try to put multiple applications on the same network? Or if I try to add a new customer or to an existing network? Every once in a while, I want to expand my network fabric for more capacity. Again, I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat. Is this going to work out? Uh, can I set security or isolation policy? Can I use my network to keep one person from talking to another person? Or a set of hosts talking to another set of hosts, perhaps even in a virtualized environment? Maybe because I want to be able to migrate virtual machines around. Taking it a step further, maybe I want to guarantee some level of performance, not just to a virtual machine, but to an entire application running across my network. Uh, sometimes I have to do traffic engineering to ensure that I get the most out of my network. And every once in a while, I may actually want to introduce a product from a new vendor. Is it really going to work with all the other vendors out there? So this is the state of the art, and this is what the adrenaline junkies, with the hubris, can probably achieve today. But the rest of the world is left like this. They're really excited on the edge of the seat when a link fails or they want to upgrade software. They're praying, right? If they try to share the network, among customers or applications. And all that other great stuff that the network's supposed to give them, they don't even bother doing. Right? Let's, let's not deal with the network in, in this way. So what we're left with in this world is, if we don't touch the network, maybe it won't break. If we pay homage to the network, <laughs> leave it alone, it won't do bad things to us. Hopefully the bits will keep being delivered. And so what I'm going to argue is that this is going to lead to fundamental underinvestments in the network. And by the way, going back to the previous point, we have certain vendors who, internally at least, I don't know if they use the term externally, are trying to build god boxes. They refer to them as god boxes. These things that you don't ever need to upgrade, they're going to last forever. And again, if you pay homage to them, and also pay the yearly maintenance contract, which costs almost as much as the box itself, it is just going to keep working. Okay, so now what we're left with is, okay, don't touch the network, don't upgrade the network. Um, upgrading the network means it's, I've amortized it over six or eight years, tear it down, start over, right, with the next set of boxes. There's no incremental expansion, there's no upgrade of capacity in terms of ports, in terms of speed. So we know how to upgrade the servers. We know how to upgrade the storage, right? Every uh, 18 months, every 12 months, I'm bringing new servers in, I'm bringing bigger drives in. And they keep getting faster and faster and faster. And yet they're left with this network that's the same speed as it was before, and really way too slow. So one of the things that uh, I've been arguing for a while is that we're left with unbalanced systems, um, where millions of dollars systematically of compute and storage are underutilized because the network can't keep them fed. So let me give you one example, there are lots of them, uh, from my own work. Uh, there's a yearly contest, right, again, among these uh, sort of uh, a nerd adrenaline junkies to see who can sort the most data the fastest. It's called TerraSort. Um, lots of rules to it. question is, how fast can you sort 100 terabytes of data? For a number of years, the record holder was Yahoo. They sorted 100 terabytes of data in just under three hours, 177 minutes, on 3,452 servers. Very impressive, right? They had 3,452 servers. That was very, very impressive. <laughs> uh, they sorted in under three hours, and uh, that, that was pretty great as well. Except if you do the math, that works out to 22 megabits per second per server. Three megabytes per second, or roughly the speed of my first five megabyte hard drive. And this was a while ago, right? So now we have these servers that are pretty fast with a bunch of disks. That, and sorting, by the way, is not computationally intensive. That's 
CPU is really the least of your worries when you're sorting data. That's going at 22 megabits per second. We've got these 10 gigabit networks that uh, lots of people are selling, 10 gigabit NICs, etc. So I thought, boy, wouldn't it be great if with not 3,452 servers, but with 34 servers, we could sort the same amount of data faster. Okay, long, long story short, um, we wound up with 50 servers, 10 gigabit network, uh, sorting the same amount of data roughly twice as fast. Right, so, so what does this say? It says that because the network is so hard to deal with, right, we're actually having all these servers that could otherwise be doing useful work. With all these disks that could otherwise be spinning lots of interesting data on and off them, left idle. So Yahoo's network and its public information turned out to be a one gigabit network oversubscribed five to one. Right, delivering 200 megabits per second of download to each server. Modern servers today with a single core can drive 10 gigabits per second. And modern servers today have dozens of cores. So really today we should be building networks that can go 40 gigabits per second, not blocking, for 3,000 servers or, or more or whatever network you want to build. Well, we can't do that today. So what we're left with is a network that gets in my way rather than enables the computation and data that I really want to be doing. And so I would argue that people would actually spend more money if they had a way to actually get this performance back out of their systems. Okay, so companies should and would pay a lot of money for a network that adds to their ROI on their compute and storage infrastructure. So what we should be working toward in networking, right? The adrenaline junkies who are left on the edge of their seats, I mean, they're ready for anything. But for me to be paying, I would pay a lot of money, especially as I get older, if my network looked more like this. No explosions, no worries. If I, if I want to upgrade something, if I want to add capacity, if I want to add bandwidth, if I want to bring a new application on, I do. And, and I would pay a lot of money for that. And I would argue that a lot of people would pay a lot of money for that. Okay, so how do we get there from here? So, you've heard a lot about this. The driving philosophy behind networking today has been approximate the global optimum based on local view of events. So this is actually almost a direct quote from my first lecture in undergraduate networking, if I have my teaching hat on. And this is a beautiful thing, right? This is a really hard problem. And it's allowed the internet to get to where it is today. I would say without this, right, if we try to come up with some global optimum, if we try to come up with some brain, the internet would not be here today. All the success that it's enjoyed, forget about it. And the intellectual depth and richness of achieving the global optimum based on a local view of events is just awesome. Academics, smart engineers, they can really sink their teeth into this. So we're going to treat network fabrics as just a collection of individual boxes, each acting out autonomously. And that allowed the internet, right, you just bring along your box, connect to an existing box, and you're part of the internet. Right, truly a beautiful thing. But at the scale that we're at right now, and with the changing set of assumptions that we have in the internet today relative to where we were, certainly when the internet started, um, we're actually left with some of the downsides. Right? So it's an interesting situation. The internet wouldn't be here, wouldn't be successful if we try to do anything different. And yet, where we're at now with the internet, we need to be doing something different, different than what got us here. Okay, and so this is echoing some of the things that you've been hearing over the past uh, day and a half, two days. How do we get there from here? Well, we need to be leveraging all the progress that's been made in other areas of computer systems over the past 30 years. And number one for me is we need more distributed systems in computer networks. Strange, given that computer networks and certainly the internet is the world's largest distributed system. So we should really be taking advantage of some of the things that have been developed for fault tolerance, for scalability, for using logically centralized control, and you've heard this term before, for maybe getting the global optimum without having to stand on your head using your local view of the system. Lots of uh, nice systems built around this idea. Lots of papers in this space. I'll give you one example from Google. So um, there's this uh, famous paper called the Google File System. 
Uh, I'll give just a bit of historical context. Before this paper was published in 2003, the entire academic research community, and certainly the entire academic research community, and also portions of industry, was focused on the problem of building file systems in a completely decentralized peer-to-peer -peer manner. Right? Napster had come along, and everyone was about, how do I build a file system fully decentralized? Lots of great research, lots of great systems built, but it turned out that it was too hard. And Google had this pretty controversial paper at the time saying, you build this massive scale file system running across tens of thousands of servers, and you have a single centralized element controlling it. It was shocking in its boldness to go back so far. And people said, how could you do something so simplistic? And yet no one could point to any other system that worked at that scale. OK, so that's one side. Um, other things that are very important. High-level programming languages to specify what your intent is. So I thought the phonetic work that uh, Jen uh, presented yesterday was right on. We need to be able to specify what we mean and have a compiler, essentially, interacting with the runtime, making it happen. On the flip side, you need to take it a step further with correctness proofs to enforce whatever intent it is that you had. Right? So there's something that's actually going to go off and program a whole bunch of switches, but you want to make sure that the resulting programming actually follows the high-level constraints that you have. And it could be, let's say, a cloud service provider that no external customer of Amazon's can touch any internal Amazon server, no matter what. And, and whatever solution you come up with needs to be checked by an independent program to make sure that's enforced. OK, um, there's a huge amount of state about the network that is spread across lots and lots of boxes. Different people want to annotate the state in different ways. What I want to need is a database extensible in a schema so that I can track the state and not have to go to one person or one server to extend the data that I want to maintain, what state that I want to maintain about it. What this means is that new applications can come along and basically add a column to the database and only populate that column for a subset of rows. This is not radical new technology. Right? Databases have known how to do this for a long time. We don't know how to do this for networks today. OK, and finally in this world, if I do have this logically centralized view of the network, if I am upgrading my fabric, how do I make sure that it's staged in such a way that there's no performance degradation and all my isolation targets are met and there's no black holing of traffic, et cetera. So for planned events, and then for unplanned events, how do I then ensure that I converge as quickly as possible? So now, logically centralized means that, okay, I actually could lose if I tried to have a very, very large scale system all having to go to one point. How do I strategically carve up my computation across my switches to make sure that this global reconvergence happens as quickly as possible? Okay, so I'll stop there. Uh, basically, the thought I want to leave you with is that we want to go from uh, networks that are too exciting to a bit more calm, enabling people to do things with the network that they were meant to do and wanting to do from the beginning, really extracting the value from the, what is the network about? It's about computation and storage. And we can't get at the computation and storage the way we need to be today. And the word of caution is that these tectonic reimaginings um, will mean, I won't say might mean, um, a few steps back before moving forward. So it's not going to be um, nirvana overnight. There's going to be a bunch of work. It's going to be hard. But to get there, we have a lot of interesting work to do.